Hello, and welcome to Politics for the People. I'm your host, Michael Striano. Thanks for listening and joining in the conversation. You can find links to our Patreon and Instagram in the show notes and sign up for our weekly newsletter. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts to help others find the show. Okay, let's get to it. On today's episode, we'll take a look at the executive order. It's always existed, but in times of increased partisanship, it tends to be used differently. For the past 12 years, executive orders have been in the news a lot, but how much do we really know about them? Where did they come from? How are they used? And how do they affect our daily lives? Let's start off with a definition. Executive orders are directives from the president that manage how the federal government operates. It might sound silly to say, but They are what their name implies, orders from the executive that can have the authority of laws. The idea isn't spelled out anywhere. Congress didn't give the president the power to sign executive orders, and there's nothing in the Constitution about it. In fact, the Constitution leaves a lot of ambiguity when it comes to the presidency. It simply says the president has executive power to make sure laws are faithfully executed. Since a conversation about executive orders is really about presidential authority, let's take a quick look at the presidency for some background. The president's function is to manage both the running of the country and so-called affairs of state. If you think about England, they have the queen, who handles cultural relations and similar matters, and the prime minister, who handles the day-to-day operations of the country. You could say our president does both of these jobs— But because of the way our government is built, the president does not rule the way a dictator or a monarch would. Instead, they only really have control over the executive branch, which is still a lot of power. What the president does not do is legislate or pass laws. All presidents have their own agendas, lists of things they want to accomplish, and they can push the country in the direction of their choosing. But they only have so much authority. To really get things done, the president must work with the legislative branch, Congress, who passes laws. We've talked a bit about the three branches of government in past episodes, so I'm not going to get into them here. But once a law has passed, it is the responsibility of the executive branch to ensure they're being followed and executed faithfully. This brings us to one way the president uses executive orders, to interpret legislation. This is something we've seen over the past few years from the Trump administration. Take the example of family separations along the southern border. The administration's stated justification for this policy was they were following the laws on the books. Is there a law requiring the federal government separate young children from their parents? Of course not. It's simply how they chose to interpret the laws to help advance their agenda. All administrations do this to varying degrees of success, and when done carefully, it can be effective in steering the federal government in a new direction. Another common use of the executive order is to provide structural changes to the federal government. Because the president only presides over the executive branch, these changes are only applicable to institutions within that branch. When we say changes, what do we mean? Well, existing departments can be altered, or entire new offices and institutions can be established. The federal government, including the military, was desegregated by executive order, and President Bush created the Department of Homeland Security by executive order after the terrorist attacks on September 11th. It seems strange that such an influential and powerful agency could be birthed unilaterally without a congressional vote but the most sweeping executive orders have actually come in the name of national security. As far back as 1793, executive actions were issued regarding national security. As the war between England and France was heating up, President Washington signed a proclamation ordering America remain neutral. When it was found to be impossible to enforce, Washington lobbied Congress, who eventually passed the Neutrality Act of 1794, codifying the proclamation into law. Then, in the 1860s, Lincoln issued a proclamation allowing the military to suppress rebellious acts, including the suspension of habeas corpus. 
This meant that rebels could be jailed without a trial or even an expressly stated reason. The proclamation was immediately challenged by the Supreme Court. Lincoln made his case before a joint session of Congress, and they passed the Habeas Corpus Act of 1863, officially giving the president that authority in certain circumstances. These actions taken by two of our most revered presidents are great examples of using executive orders to prompt legislation. Even when an order isn't very effective, as in the case with Washington, it can serve to make a political point, sending a message that legislation is needed and encouraging Congress to act. Presidential authority, including the executive order, was greatly expanded by FDR during World War II. He embraced his cousin Theodore's idea that any powers not expressly listed or given to a specific body in the Constitution fell to the president by default. The ambiguity in the Constitution made this interpretation relatively easy to justify and difficult to argue. So in the midst of the Great Depression and the country's sudden involvement in World War II, Congress gave FDR unprecedented authority. By executive order, the president federalized factories and manufacturing plants, creating an influx of funding and jobs as the United States needed supplies for, essentially, two wars. Unfortunately, an executive order was also used to create the infamous internment camps, where Japanese Americans were imprisoned out of an abundance of paranoia and an absence of compassion. Even as it was happening, the federal government seemed to regret the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans, and the executive order was rescinded as the war in the Pacific was ending. America had seen the dangers of giving too much power to the president, a reminder that our country was founded by people seeking to prevent an autocracy, a government run by a single individual. As the war was winding down, Congress began to rein in executive authority in 1944. Some powers had been codified into law, such as the War Labor Disputes Act of 1943 that allows the federalization of factories and manufacturing plants in times of crisis, but a large number of the executive orders were nullified by Congress, simply eliminating their funding. Funding is the easiest check on executive orders by the other branches, but Congress also has the power to overrule existing executive orders by legislating. When the president signs an executive order, it can carry the weight of a law, but it's not more powerful than a law. We've seen times throughout history where Congress is unable to act, and the president uses executive action to push the country forward. Perhaps the clearest example is the Emancipation Proclamation. It's touted as a wonderful, historic document, and it is, but it only exists as a precursor to the 13th Amendment which formally and irrefutably abolished slavery. The other limitation on the power of executive orders is in the courts. In our two-part episode on the Supreme Court, we talked about how they have the ability to declare a law unconstitutional. As an extension of that authority, the federal court system has the ability to eliminate executive orders found to be unjust or even unconstitutional. One of the first actions taken by the Trump administration was to place a temporary ban on travel from a list of majority Muslim countries. While the order was eventually upheld, that was only after multiple versions had been stopped by the courts and the administration was forced to make changes to the order. In a way, this back and forth is an example of our government working properly. No one branch can do whatever they want, as ensured by the system of checks and balances. Politicians' opinions on executive orders are really based on whether or not their party is in power. For the better part of eight years, the country saw the Republican Party chastise and demean President Obama and Democrats for their alleged overuse of executive orders. The GOP went so far as to question the constitutionality of executive orders at all and won in subsequent elections in part by campaigning against alleged executive overreach by the Obama administration. Of course, when power transferred to Republicans, they quickly assumed the behavior for which they had spent years maligning Democrats. So how do executive orders affect our daily lives? That really depends on the order, and they can affect our lives in 
big ways like desegregating the military or the travel ban, or not at all. Executive orders are also used for simple operational changes within the executive branch that we'll never know about. As we said at the beginning of this episode, executive orders are very much about presidential authority and serve as a reminder that our government is democratic in nature. Significant power and authority has to be given to the president, but it's not absolute. Congress and the courts have important roles ensuring our rights are not infringed upon. When this has happened, the federal government has walked back those orders and passed laws to prevent it from happening again. But when there's the potential for the president to unilaterally imprison innocent Americans, as was done in 1942, we should make sure we trust the individual who has that power, as well as the representatives in Congress who would stand in their way. That's why it's so important to vote in every election, ensuring those people will act in our best interest. Thanks for listening, and a special thanks to our patrons on Patreon for your help in making this happen, and all those who have left us a review. Be sure to check out the show notes, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, and follow us on Instagram, at Politics for the People Podcast. Want to help shape the conversation, have a say in episode topics, and get exclusive content, including early access to episodes and live conversations with me? Check the show notes, head on over to our Patreon page, and subscribe for as little as $3. We'll see you Wednesday with our newsletter and Friday with a brand new episode. Take care.